Good morning to all of you. Let's uh, begin the proceedings today. Today is uh, the presidential addresses of all eight uh, sections from the morning to afternoon. Uh, so I would like to welcome all participants who are participating physically and online. The first uh, presidential address is by Dr. R. M. Dharmadasa, the President, Section B. Dr. Dharmadasa obtained his PhD and MPhil from the University of Sri Jayawardenepura in Sri Lanka, and he obtained his BSc in Agriculture from the University of Pune. And also, he has uh, undergone an advanced training on organic agriculture from University of uh, Basel, Germany. He's a senior scientist, agronomist, environmentalist, entomologist, and currently working as a senior deputy director at Industrial Technology Institute, Sri Lanka. So, Dr. Dharmadasa has 24 years of experience in herbal technology, especially in essential oil, biodiversity, and medicinal plants, pharmacognosy, agronomy, and formulation of insect pheromone-based biopesticides, plant tissues and cell culture, and systemic, systematic study on traditional knowledge. He serves as a visiting lecturer for several universities. In addition, he is a consultant for nature-based landslide mitigation. So, welcome Dr. R. M. Dharmadasa, the Senior Deputy Director of Industrial Technology Institute and the current President of Sri Lanka, Section B, Sri Lanka Association for the Advancement of Science. Over to you, Dr. Dharmadasa. Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, President uh, of the SAS. And today, actually, uh, this is the uh, first uh, presidential address. Uh, I'm going to present it in section B. Uh, that is actually, I have cho chosen this uh, topic. It is on medicinal plants, because this is basically, it's very important, uh, you know, uh, title. Uh, for the Sri Lanka, because you know we are all talking about the many many other things, but we have given a less chance to the medicinal plants. So uh, my topic is today is the medicinal plant industry in Sri Lanka, actually current situation and future prospects. Yes, when we come to the introduction part, actually I thought uh, I thought uh, we we must have a basic idea about the medicinal plants. Yes, uh, uh, according to the WHO, uh, actually they have given the uh, several definitions and uh, the summary of all given definitions is like uh, medicinal plant is a plant that contain properties or compounds that can be used for therapeutic purposes. That's a uh, the, uh, definition given by WHO in 2008. Uh, because you know that uh, when you are uh, the reading the you know, definition, it clearly says there is a properties and compounds that can be used for the therapeutic purpose. That means every and each plant has its own therapeutic value. In that meaning, Charaka says that every plant is a medicinal plant. That is the uh, no, no, normal basic idea of this plant. But 
when you see the medicinal plant industry, we know that medicinal plants are using for the purpose of uh, traditional medicine. But actually, uh, it is, is it like this, right? Uh, we can see uh, this is the actually the you know iceberg theory. You know we are using the medicinal plants for the traditional medicine, but actual thing uh, we can visit the you know that's the visual part, and there is a hidden part also this one, right? Uh, here medicinal plants can be used in many different purposes, especially in different branches of uh, traditional medicine, Ayurveda, Yunani, Siddha, Desi Chikitsa, and also there are sub-branches are there, orthopedic, snake bite, and uh, then, uh, you know, mental disorders, and like these things. Uh, if we take the medicinal plants, uh, uh, you know, Western medicine, uh, most of the Western medicine are derived from the uh, medicinal plants. Uh, as example, you know, Raupia serpentina, a plant, we use for the, you know, production of the recipe, and that's an anti-hypertension drug, and also taxol from, uh, use, uh, taxol from also the plant, and also the, uh, we are using that uh, malaria drug, that is all, uh, that's also based on the, you know, traditional medicine, right? If we take, uh, you know, the more of these things, and uh, there are many, many other things, pharmaceutical, nutraceutical, uh, cosmaceutical, and if you take the agriculture sector, it's also very, you know, very much used, you know, organic uh, pesticide, organic uh, insecticide, organic uh, fungicide, and also essential, es essential oil-based industries, especially for the perfumes and fragrances. And also we can use in, um, you know, different uh, plants as uh, ornamental plants. Uh, then uh, we can take the, you know, that, um, some salt plant as well as, you know, that um, some of the, you know, very beautiful medicinal plants are there. We can use them as uh, ornamental plants. And also we can use these plants, uh, you know, that um, herbal beverages. Now it is a very, you know, the very high time to introduce these uh, herbal medicines for the herbal, herbal beverages. And also we can use landscaping as well as um, currently actually it is uh, highly valued now actually. Nowadays it is uh, much talk about that, about the, uh, you know, nature-based uh, landslide mitigation techniques. Actually, we can use medicinal plants as a resilience of the, you know, socio-economical resilience of the landslide uh, areas. And also, the very recently, I have found some literature because in our ancient people, they have used the medicinal plants for the sake of, you know, the, uh, some, some firewoods. Because these medicinal plants has more polyphenol, tannins, and some other flavonoids. These compounds are evaporated, and then these compounds are, you know, integrated into the, our food products. There's a, you know, food drying system. We can use these things for the, uh, you know, the sake of the uh, making new industries from the medicinal plants. This is the hidden part, and the, we know that a very little part of the medicinal plants, right? Not only that, if we take the Sri Lanka, actually Sri Lanka is a very small country in the Asia and it is surrounded by the sea, and it has, uh, you know, around 65,000 of, uh, you know, that uh, uh, square kilometers, and this small country, this is a very, very important thing. It has more than 46 agroclimatic regions. That means uh, soil properties and, you know, fauna, flora, climatic, macroclimatic, microclimatic, everything is different in this particular area. So as well as, you know, there is a high biodiversity country because uh, if you take the, uh, there is a total forest cover of 29%. Out of this 29%, we have more than 4,000 plant species there. And also, uh, there are, you know, the, uh, you know, a lot of uh, opportunities for the uh, medicinal plant because now, now already we have identified more than uh, half of a plant as a medicinal plant. And also, uh, very, you know, that it is a very pathetic situation to tell uh, most of the medicinal plants which required for the traditional knowledge, especially for Ayurveda, uh, Yunani, Siddha, Desi Chikitsa, and homeopathy, all these materials are coming from the jungles. That means 95% of the local requirement is coming from jungles. But unfortunately, now jungles are little bit, little, they are uh, deteriorating. So now we have to think about medicinal plants, how we go in uh, our future. Right. If we take the medicinal plant industry, uh, this is a very brief, uh, you know, very brief introduction for the medicinal plant industry. You know, we have a lot of, uh, you know, that um, uh, Ayurveda, Siddha, Yunani, Desi, Chikitsa, uh, and homeopathy and aromatherapy. And uh, Sri Lanka import 2.2 million of kilograms per year, uh, uh, belonging to 40 species of plants, and uh, expending more than 176 million rupees annually. 
So, by uh, there are uh, more than uh, 30 active importers. Uh, they import for the production of herbal medicine, herbal cosmetics, herbal beverages uh, for more than 200 registered companies, especially large and medium scale, sorry, large scale, there are 12 companies in Sri Lanka and also Ayurveda hospitals, there are several hospitals and uh, more than 25,000 Ayurveda doctors are there and also SM is more than 200 and we have, still we have more than 800 traditional practices in this country. Right. Uh, let's move on to the, the, the next part that, uh, you know, industrial potential of medicinal plants. Actually, what we can use. Yes. It is here we can use traditional medicine as a raw material for the traditional medicine. And then we can produce some, uh, the, some, some products which required for the, you know, treatment for the diseases. And no herbal drugs and cosmetic and some value added products. And uh, the modern technology, the current scenario is the herbal supplements. And also, it's a very high demand for the cosmetic industry in Sri Lanka as well as all over the country. And also, we can use it, uh, you know, landslide mitigation as well as soil conservation purposes. Those are the major things. Yes. Uh, this medicinal plants used in snake bite treatment, there's a very, you know, traditional system of medicine uh, we practice in Sri Lanka. Here we can see, actually, uh, when we have a snake bite, uh, it is a very difficult to control first time because, uh, you know, in Western medicine, it needs some symptoms. It needs some symptoms to treat. But here, actually, without symptoms in our traditional practices, when the, you know, the dutea came, that, that, that when the dutea come into the, the practitioner, then the practitioner knows what is the snake who have beaten and uh, where it has beaten and what are the treatment I have to give. And they are treating almost all, you know, all organs. That meaning uh, the, they are giving the payao for drinking, for patu for the, you know, pasting and nasne and oil and creaming and steaming and wound, steaming of wound. And also uh, they, are, they, are, they are putting some medicine for the, has, the hisakurichi and then also the, they are, they are, you know, washing the wound with medicinal material and creaming the wound. And also, they are giving some eye treatment, that's anjana, right? All those things we are using. There are several medicinal plants, actually. Those are very, you know, they uh, you know, 100% used in traditional medicine in here. And some of the things are sasande and hatavari, and then there are uh, uh, araru, buru, and neri, as well as uh, some other, you know, that uh, uh, cosinium penistratum plant. And also, don't forget, Sri Lanka is a high biodiversity with the, you know, snakes. There are, there are more than 96 land snakes in Sri Lanka. Those snakes are categorized into three categories, uh, four categories. There's a uh, uh, non-venomous and mildly venomous and moderate venomous and uh, high venomous. That actually highly venomous, uh, you know, the uh, uh, snakes are only the uh, most of the toxic cases that happens. Right. If we uh, go to the cosmetic industry, you know, due to the side effects of the existing cosmetics, now actually world trend is, uh, you know, going to the, you know, the, the, the herbal cosmetic industry. So, uh, the, uh, therefore, the market, you know, the market of the cosmetic industry is, uh, you know, uh, developing day by day. Uh, if we take the, you know, market size in US, there are, you know, uh, 108,000 is a skin care and then hair care, then color cosmetics and like this. There are several, uh, many other, you know, that um, uh, branches of the cosmetic industry. And also if we take the, you know, the market size, it's 2015, it's a 10 billion, but it will reach up to 24 billion in 2024. And also the most of the products, uh, you know, demand is for the skin care products, skin care and hair care products. And so on, so now actually this is the research of the, our survey we have conducted uh, in our institute. And where we found the cosmetic is a very, very booming industry in Sri Lanka in near future. So therefore we have to use the uh, medicinal plant in Sri Lanka. Having understand that world scenario, actually we have conducted our own survey in Sri Lanka and we have found there are more than 133 medicinal plants belonging to 64 families in medicinal plant, uh, that cosmetic industry. And uh, they are basically, the most of the plants are belongs to the Pabesia. It's a very easy cultivation, very easy, 
acid growing plant and then we can introduce these things and most of the things are going to the skin care and hair care. And also there are, you know, the, uh, most of the, uh, you know, the past parts of the dip different parts of the plants are used for the, you know, the uh, cosmetic industry and almost all parts of the plant we can use in the cosmetic industry. And also, you know, the, if we want to uh, develop the cosmetic industry, actually first we have to use the traditional knowledge. Traditional knowledge is the basic for the any, any treatment because actually now we are taking the things from the books, but traditional medicine, it was developed by the, you know, that, uh, that spiritual power of the ancient people. So that thing we have to uh, use properly. So therefore, ethnopharmacologists pharmacological surveys on existing medicinal plants, and then their uh, uh, development of propagation and cultivation techniques, and also their valuation, and those things we have to do to protect this industry uh, carefully. Yes, uh, then the other thing is medicinal plant use in bioengineering. Actually, uh, you know that bioengineering part, uh, uh, this is a very interesting part in Sri Lanka, uh, because now landslides are, you know, that uh, it is, uh, you know, the happening day by day. So actually what we are thinking is uh, earlier it is uh, used conventional methods, but now uh, they are nature-based uh, systems. But this nature-based system, Sri Lanka has very good opportunity to use, especially in, uh, you know, then some graminae plants because, uh, you know, savandara, you know, pangiri, sere, those things. And we can cultivate those things and we can harvest those things and we can give the job opportunities for the rural, you know, the, you know uh, poor youth. And then we can start value added industry. That's also, it's a very big boom in industry. Now we can work for those things. And also if we take the essential oil, you know, startups, if some graduates and if some person is going to start medicinal plants, here is the, you know, very good, uh, you know, opportunity for them and food and beverage, cosmetics, toileries, aromatherapy, home, hair care and, uh, you know, essential oil market is projected projected to reach and US dollars 11.19 billion 2022. Now it is happening, right? Now we can use medicinal plants for the organic pesticide, organic weedicide, organic disease and pest control, as well as perfumes, spa and cosmetics. Those are the most potential plant species, actually Kollangkola, then Sere, Pangiri, and then Savandara, and Tulsi. Uh, those things we can uh, use for the value addition of the medicinal plants, right? Actually, we have done the one of the study. Actually, you know, uh, when, when we smell the medicinal plants, it gives some, you know, inherited, uh, inherited uh, smell. That smell is coming from the essence, the compounds, you know, but you know that, uh, that smelly compound uh, found in the plant. So uh, then, actually, that, that technology we can use for the attract or, uh, you know, that um, repellent of the insect. So in my study, actually, I, uh, I achieved that uh, I collected these plants and I found that, yes, the, you know, the, some osimum plants, that some madrutara plants, we can attract some in insects because it has uh, more, more than 60 compounds, 60 volatile compounds. All these compounds are either attracted or either repellent to the, uh, you know, insects. So that theory I have used for the production of Basca, that is a Bactosera species controlling agent. So it was very popular. Actually now the technology was transferred to the, one of the private companies in Sri Lanka. So here, if someone need to, you know, start the, you know, cultivation of a medicinal plant, you know, that uh, 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 lemongrass, that meaning Simupavang citratus. Actually this is a very, you know, that very, you know, short term crop and we can grow it very easily. And there are more than, you know, uh, 4,500, 5,000, uh, you know, that uh, we can get the, you know, yield. And also then, uh, you know, the one, one, one bottle of essential oil is around 5,000. And then cost benefit ratio is 1.3, right? And this is very good for the, you know, the startup for the, especially in the, uh, you know, that, um, uh, that um, you know, cottage level industries. And also this, uh, you know, this other, other plant, we call it uh, citronella. Citronella also a very good plant uh, for the starting of the, you know, that um, uh, startup project. If anyone interested, there are ample opportunities. And I have used citronella oil for the production of NAPCA, natural, uh, you know, nat uh, natural pest control agent. The essential oil of the citronella is work almost all insect pest. Right, we can we can repel or we can kill the insect pests using essential oil of the you know uh, the 
Pangiri or Citrella. And also, uh, recently, actually, one person came to me and asked me, uh, sir, I have one plant in my home garden. It's a smelly like, uh, you know, the cinnamon uh, clove and like these things. And they, they brought one or two parts of the, you know, the plant. And I just checked for that, those things for the basic phytochemicals, essential oil content and composition, as well as total phenol and perennoid content. I found that this plant contained more than, five, you know, the compounds which is similar to the all our spices, that, that plant called all spice. So that particular client, he has developed the one product called Hera Spice by using this thing. Now it is a very lucrative market in Sri Lanka. And the major compound present in this particular plant, all spice plant, is uh, you know there is more than 85 percent of essential oil composition. It's a it's a very you know highly used in the uh, you know that uh, food sector. Yes, just think this is a very you know imagine thing. If you need to start some startups, don't think much more. Just see the you know Niang Vatagoru. This is a very you know wild plant. We are not using even right. If we take the Niang Vatagoru. The, we can use the, the inner part of the Niang Vatagoru for the production of several products. That's a very good example. If someone needs to use medicinal plants in different industries, we can see their uh, soap and uh, routine material, natural, you know, sandals, and there are many other products we can do. With that Niang Vatagoru, it's a useless thing in normal environment, right? But we can use all those things. Right. This is the very, you know, the uh, critical part. Here you can see actually the medicinal plant industry, so analysis I have done. Here actually, uh, this is actually a uh, uh, very uh, good analysis I have done so far. So we have strength, we have also weaknesses, and we have also a lot of opportunities, and we have threats. The major thing, actually, uh, I just summarized those things. Uh, it is not time to read all those things, but if you start, uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned in my previous slide, Actually, the Sri Lanka is a, a high biodiversity country, and we have, you know, more than uh, 4,000 species, and all those are, uh, you know, strength. And, you know, we have a lot of opportunities, you know, international market for the traditional medicine, international market for the, the other, you know, the other value added products, and also the organic products, and also, uh, you know, consider preference for them, you know, the, some, uh, uh, Yes, yeah, some synthetic synthetic products we can replace by the this uh, you know herbal material and for the high demand for the uh, you know value medicinal plant based uh, products and also we can uh, use this uh, you know the medicinal plant industry uh, you know the very high level because of its it uh, you know its uh, potential and also we have threat we are importing all this material from India and other eight countries spending more than 176 million rupees and also um, you know there are several you know finished products are coming from India now they are introduced into our country so those things are actually I can I have summarized here and those are the our short term results and also if we need to you know the, 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 the you know if we need to you know develop this industry first we have to identify the plants properly, then we can use morphology, anatomy, uh, powder microscopic, and chemically as well as genetically and DNA level. So all those things we can do, and then we can prepare herbarium seeds for each and every plant. Then we have to conserve these plants, and uh, we can use in authentic plant for our production cycle. And then we have to develop the propagation and cultivation protocol for these plants. And you know here the you know the the technology for the you know the. Uh, vegetative propagation as well as technology for the uh, seed propagation. And here we have to, you know, cultivation practices. We have to measure the whatever the good time for the harvesting and we have to harvest properly and then we have to uh, collect seed material and then drying and processing all those things we have to do uh, very properly and we have to develop the protocols, we have to develop the technologies for them, all those things. And also we have to standardize our, our product by doing physically, chemically, microbiologically, and genetically. All these uh, products we have to do according to the WHO as well as EU, as well as uh, USDA, and uh, several other uh, you know, authorities. They have released now guidelines. We can do you know, standardization for our product using these guidelines. And also, you know, this is a very huge lacking part. 
promotional activities. Actually, I am happy to say in uh, you know SRAS, I have started the promotional act activity in 2012, uh, establishment of herbal garden in uh, you know they are in uh, schools and younger generation is the key point here. We have given our technology, we have given our awareness to the uh, you know these people and we have to do it better. And then also we have to do some publication, handbooks as well as leaflets, uh, booklets and some databases and all those things we have to do. And also we have to publish in national and international reputed journals. Right. Here are some publications I have to do in the general of ethnopharmacology and general of industrial crops and products. And the finally, your part, yes, can I grow medicinal plants? Why not? Medicinal plant is not just in medicinal, but it is a, you know, your day-to-day -day usage plant. You know, here, if you have your home garden, you can include vegetables, cosmetic potential plants, fruits, uh, and home remedies, as well as leafy vegetables and all those things. Then if you take your uh, spice garden, then you, uh, you can use it for the, your fruit garden and you can you do herbal garden, whatever it is you can do. Uh, if you are medicinal plant lover, you can start, you can add. Some may ask me whether uh, we, can, we, we cannot do these things, we have no garden. But all these plants you can grow in your pot as a pot plant, especially comarica and many other plants we can grow like this. Right. So. Uh, what we can do in future, if we really need to, you know, the protect our medicinal plant sector, first we have to do the conservation part, first we have to identify what are the medicinal plants available and we have to, you know, standardize those things and then uh, we have to cultivate and uh, develop the agronomic and post harvest techniques for the medicinal plants and then we have to do the valuable product development and then we can uh, do the standardization part and then also marketing. Marketing is a lacking part in this sector because people are not aware about the medicinal plant sector. Right. As a summary, I can say medicinal plants are highly valuable and industrial potential plant species. And uh, there are ample opportunities to develop medicinal plant sector in Sri Lanka, uh, especially community-based projects. If we do these things, uh, these are the, you know, these are the suggestions. Uh, please develop, please try to develop traditional medicines, pharmaceutical industry, established nutraceutical industry, cosmetic and perfume industry, very well products, functional foods and landscape in industry and raw material production for the traditional medicine and also nature based landslide mitigation and also ecotourism. Ecotourism is a key area because we do not want to kill our plant, we do not want to uproot our plant with uh, growing it either home garden, either botanical garden or whatever it is in your uh, pot plant, then we can display those things in all this information. As example, I can say with the Comarica, you can do it. And we can help the people to, uh, you know, start value added products in, uh, in this plant. Right. This is the one thing I have, you know, the past COVID uh, situation. Actually, I have done, there is uh, one traditional claims, you know, past pangaree is the very good for the uh, you know, uh, prevention of respiratory diseases. So I have found there are past pangaree, uh, you know, lime, sour orange, sweet orange, mandarin, and uh, the yakinara. Those things are very famous in traditional medicine, for the, especially in the, you know, the different uh, ailments. Uh, I, have, I have named those ailments. And then I did some, uh, you know, the antimicrobial, uh, uh, you know, properties of some compounds and I found that those compounds are present there. So actually we can easily tell that these things we can validate by using our modern knowledge and then we can publish those things and we can start some very well products from these things. This is the one example I have done in the COVID situation. Right. And Thank you very much. This is the, my university team. Actually, they are working very hard. Uh, every year, I am training more than uh, mm, 10 students for several universities. Right. Thank you very much for your kind attention. This is me. Thank you very much, Dr. Dharmadasa, for the very informative uh, talk and also sharing your experience with us. And also, we know the medicinal plants are very precious uh, resources, resource in Sri Lanka. So, 
once again, on behalf of the CELES, I thank you for your, uh, for the, for the successful year you conducted and also for your excellent presentation. So this is a small token of appreciation for being the president of uh, section B.
address is uh, by Dr. Vasanti Vikramasinghe of Section F. Dr. Vasanti Vikramasinghe is a researcher with nearly uh, 30 years of experience in applied economic research, development, econom development economics, and in particular, agriculture development policy in Sri Lanka. And she obtained her PhD in agriculture economics from University of uh, Gaysin, Germany. And she obtained her MSc in Agriculture Economics from University of Peradeni and her BSc also from in Agriculture from University of Peradeni. She has many work experience and uh, she's has, uh, she was an assistant professor in Fiji National University and a senior research fellow in Germany, Korea Foundation. And she's a researcher and head of the department in Hector for Bagadu Agrarian Research and Training Institute. So, Dr. Vasanti, I invite you for your presidential address. She's the president of Section F of Sri Lanka Association for the Advancement of Science in 2020. Over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, distinguished uh, council members and the uh, executive committee members of Section F. It's full view. Can I get the full view of it? Oh, yeah, okay, right. Uh, the topic, uh, the address I am making today on domestic agriculture sector in the post-green revolution era, the science research gap that I uh, uh, understood over the history reviewing and some research work. Sri Lankan domestic agriculture sector has drifted from its innovation path due to internal and external factors that influence the ecosystem of agricultural research. So let us first uh, uh, define what the domestic agriculture sector. Domestic agriculture sector primarily involves cultivation of rice, other field crops, vegetables, fruits for the domestic uh, consumption. And um, the innovation that we talk here is primarily is on the biochemical technology. Uh, when we uh, consider the technology used in the agriculture sector primarily, we can categorize them into biochemical technology and machinery technology. Uh, the intention of today's uh, talk, I am confining uh, it to the biochemical technology. As we know, the machinery technology was primarily imported technology to country. country. Uh, we are one of the uh, highly mechanized in this uh, South Asian region, to the, uh, thanks to the technology developed in other parts of the world. And uh, in relation to these two technologies, what we uh, find in terms of the productivity mainly land productivity and the labor productivity. Uh, land productivity is primarily, again, back to the biochemical te technology and the labor productivity, as we know, the land man ratio uh, in the recent past has gone down, increasing the labor productivity in this country. Uh, with land productivity, again, the newly improved varieties and the associated input, water, fertilizer, agrochemicals plays the, play the main role. This paper addresses the historical purview of agriculture research in Sri Lanka because my interest basically on the uh, biochemical technology and its innovations. And I observed that there exists a research science gap. According to the Evanson 2000, research gap is defined as the difference between research potential yields and best practice yields. 
Research potential is, the, is again a hypothetical best practice yield that would be expected to be attained as a result of successful applied research programs directed towards a particular crop. Science gap, again, it's a hypothetical uh, yield that it is attainable through scientific discoveries. So my concern is uh, two periods, one pre uh, and during Green Revolution and the post-Green Revolution. So what uh, Green Revolution is defined by uh, Hazel and Farmer as, Green Revolution is a set of research technology transfer initiatives occurring between 1950 and the late 1960s that increase agriculture production worldwide, beginning most markedly in the late 1960s when the institutional structure was formed. The initiatives resulted in this adoption of new technologies, including high yield varieties of mainly uh, rice, wheat, and uh, especially dwarf wheat rice. It associated with chemical fertilizer, agrochemicals, and controlled water supply, particularly irrigation in Sri Lanka, and some newer methods of cultivations. All these together were seen as a package of practices to supersede the traditional technology that has been adopted by farmers. Here I'm going to make a look at a comparative status of status of varietal development in pre and green revolution periods in Sri Lanka internationally. Uh, when we looked at the history of Sri Lankan research, it goes back to 1822 when the Royal Botanical Garden was uh, established in Peradeniya and um, started investigations on indigenous plant varieties. It is also claimed that to be one of the way of exchanging these uh, plant materials from colonial uh, to the, the West. So uh, whatever it is, we have started some work and uh, started to publish this work from 1881 uh, as ag a tropical agriculturist uh, uh, under the Ceylon Agriculture Society. And in 1912, uh, Department of Agriculture was formed. Uh, that time also we had a a fairly a trained, experienced professional cadre to carry out research, who was trained outside overseas. And uh, we started initial uh, research work on pure lying selections. Particularly, the emphasis was given on rice. Now, when we look at the international uh, contemporary uh, research undertaken in the other part of the rest of the world, already by 1920, uh, Japanese had exhausted the potential of pure line selection as a strategy for improvement of rice and uh, rice varieties and embarking on hybridization program. Uh, rice hybridization in Japan uh, after uh, in late 1920s they started and they found a mutant uh, jikoku that's a dwarf gene uh, that whole uh, that changed the whole plant structure architecture in uh, Japonica varieties. You know rice has very many, uh, three kinds. Japonica varieties, uh, the architecture was mainly changed because of introduction of this mutant variety, uh, gene. And on the other side of the wheat's uh, uh, history, we see that uh, dwarfing genes was found in not in 10 wheat varieties that again Japanese, they found. And if you looked at how this gene variety was formed, the parent lines, one from again US, and the others again, some US uh, American cross, uh, US Japanese cross. Uh, now, while being uh, this research undertaken, uh, you know, the Second World was started, but at the, there were some uh, famines and other shortage of food was uh, reported. In early 1941, uh, actually, this uh, seeds of green revolution, the in beginning of this uh, green revolution began as this, uh, this philanthropy Rockefeller Foundation sent a team to Mexican agriculture. So in 1943, the Mexican government founded the CIMIT, the Organization for Maize and Wheat Improvements, with the funding of uh, these philanthropic organizations and the US backing. Uh, there was a program, uh, and uh, the man who received the uh, the, the scientist who received the uh, Nobel Prize Peace Prize uh, 
uh, Norman Bolok was the uh, person behind the whole uh, uh, this uh, revolution, and he started incorporating some of this uh, knowledge and uh, the help of this uh, this dwarf gene, he was able to produce this miracle wheat in 1954, and he. Uh, released this dwarf spring variety in Mexican program. And this, again, uh, Washington State, US also developed this uh, dwarf dean winter variety. These varieties were then spread to other parts of the world. Sri Lanka is not a country that uh, is consuming more, because we have emphasis most on the rice sector. And this was spread in American, South American regions. <coughs> uh, as this uh, stagnation of world rice production, FAO uh, take initiatives, took initiatives uh, uh, forming the International Rice Commission to look after the rice research programs. Particularly, the emphasis was on uh, Japonica indica variety hybridization, uh, mainly focusing the Indian uh, subcontinent, and uh, but this was without a success. Now, um, let's look at what happened in the Sri Lankan uh, uh, be, while at the same time, the contemporary literature, we say that the, we also started with pure line selection. The importance of, uh, but whatever the pure lines we selected, we had to have these adaptivity trials. We started, therefore we had to have new stations uh, all around the country. And we were able to reach the uh, rising level of uh, less than, uh, one hectare per, one ton per hectare. And then we uh, went on to introducing exotic varieties from, particularly from India and uh, Indonesia. And the experience of this Japanese experience of rice hybridization, we also started hybridizing uh, Indica Indica varieties. Actually, this is a pioneering idea of, uh, from Sri Lanka that uh, the failure of Japanica Indica varieties, but go for Indica Indica varieties, and we were able to produce this H4 variety uh, from some of the genetic material from Indonesia. So we were able to increase our national average yield to about 2.5 tons per hectare. <coughs> uh, now, US also was helping this uh, Asian part, looking after the rice research uh, in happening in this uh, Asian region, and they also provided support. By, and also, this again, these philanthropic organizations like Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, started the initiative of this International Rice Research Institute. In 1960s, was established, and the Philippine government uh, was the base uh, country. Uh, it was also saying that Sri Lanka was also considered in this uh, process, but somehow the Philippines managed to establish ERI there. And uh, the main uh, important activities or the main functions of this was to set up, setting up such international research institute was to uh, support the national research programs, which thought to be lacked with the sufficient strength and organizational power, and also uh, to support develop national research program through training and provision of new plant varieties and technologies, and building up local research cap capacity, capability in the developing countries. And the, the technical uh, component of it is improved plant type. Again, uh, indica rice varieties were tested by uh, incorporating some of the dwarf genes. So the main revolution here is the uh, dwarf incorporation of dwarf D genes to the rice uh, genome. The first Sri Lankan collaborative venture with ERI was taken place at the same time in 1960. As soon as it was formed, we were partner of it. And uh, it continued and we renewed its, uh, our collaboration in 1969 again. And uh, we were uh, able to get this uh, DGWG uh, gene, gene, a mutant from Taiwan. and. Uh, but that some of the, uh, the invention of these uh, uh, hybridization programs like uh, TN1 and IR8, although it was successful in other parts of the world, other part of Asia, uh, we were not able to uh, achieve the same results. 
So we uh, again started our uh, hybridization program with another Indian variety, Indonesian variety, and uh, it was one of successful program, and we produced BG1111. I think it's one of the important breakthrough in rice research in Sri Lanka. And subsequently, uh, in the other hybridization programs, DGWG also was incorporated. <coughs> and we also uh, were able to get some US funding. And there was a program from 1972 to 84. We know uh, this US is as a project. Uh, there were many uh, PhD trainees, a uh, lot of collaborations, new research, uh, new uh, varieties were formed. And this was uh, actually one of the uh, strongest uh, collaboration we had in this RICE program. Uh, Adam Payne, who revived the agriculture sector pre during this Green Revolution, he argues that Sri Lankan research in 60s to 80s offers evidence of a vital, competent research organization and program. So we had a very uh, uh, vibrant uh, agriculture research system. Uh, he concerned about the techniques that we use and the plant varieties and uh, other uh, programs that we adopted. And uh, he went on to mention that Ceylon Daily News in 82 uh, reported that the International Rice Research Institute has selected the two varieties, BG367-4 and BG367-7, as the best high-yielding varieties in Southeast Asia and Africa. <coughs> now, going by this uh, review, what we found, what was notable in this research program and what made it possible to reach this objective were the open source of genetic materials and gene sharing, particularly the main dwarf gene that was uh, 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 shared from Japan to US, US to Japan, and Indonesia, and other parts, and finally to Sri Lanka. So that's the open so, uh, source information, source of genetic material, how helpful in developing our research, the potential yields of rice. And also this philanthropic capital. It was also said that Cold War strategy, because US uh, was supporting the, their, their uh, favorite countries, and therefore they went on to help this. But whatever the argument it is, but this was really helpful in establishing this system. The International Agriculture Research Center, again, what the help of this organization they built, uh, this International Agriculture Research Centers act as a global biological commons of genetic resources. And this formalization was implemented through an elaborate system of internal, international nurseries with breeding hubs, free sharing of germplasms, collaboration uh, in information collection, and the development of human resources and international collaborative network. So this was wonderful uh, when we looked at how the, the, we have achieved these successes in the rice uh, agriculture research system. Uh, at the same time, we have been able to uh, help the other parts of the countries by having been uh, to having been uh, uh, sent some 222 types of rice varieties, and it's, that is a B in kept in International Rice Gene Bank. So now, uh, but uh, you know that uh, in the recent after 1980s, 90s, we first observed the Sri Lankan yield started plateau started to be experiencing in 80s, 84 from onwards, and again 90s. So we have not been able to achieve much of what we expected. Let us see what really was happening in the uh, development paradigm. I mean, how the world order changes after that. In the early mid 90s, the germplasm sharing and international breeding programs of the CGI era that had operated as what essentially informal open source program came under, under stress from number of quarters, unlike uh, those days, now it is a restricted sharing. The first was with the core operating costs and funding became to, to dry up. The second, the private sector breeding and biotechnology programs rapidly expanded in the north with the implication of free exchange of germplasm. So that threatened to the free ex germplasm uh, exchange. 
And then uh, international treaties, you know, WTO, there are some proper, uh, proprietorship uh, treaties that came, which let the, your product to be uh, patenting, and that also badly affected this sector. The change affected the freedom of exchange germplasm at different stages in the breeding seed cycle and led to uncertainty and high transaction cost in international germplasm exchange, which, is, which in some cases resulted uh, reduced germplasm flows. So what was openly shared among the developing countries was now under threat. So uh, let's see, the, the United States first introduced the idea of patenting uh, living materials in the 1980s, and the Western countries soon followed their lead. The number of patents on plants worldwide has increased 100-fold uh, from 120 in 1990 to 12,000 today. Private sector, again, another institutional innovation that came, private sector and multinational companies were started to dominating in the seed industry and patenting of plants. Patent add to picture of decreasing competition that benefit large companies, but is detrimental to small scale, regional, small countries breeders. Finally, to the food security. So in the same line uh, of this multinationals operation, uh, but it led to the market concentration now within among the few, in the hands of few multinationals. Bayer, now Monsanto has been now under Bayer, and the Dow DuPont, it's a, again a collaboration, uh, and Syngenta. So these three uh, giants uh, mainly handle this sector. Uh, this, this means that just two companies, mainly by uh, Bayer and the uh, Dow point, and now it's Syngenta. Now they handle the majority of the seed industry. <coughs> and on the other hand, the international development assistant also took a different dimension that uh, multinational companies became themselves the development assistant. If you look at Syngenta has their own uh, 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 NGOs supporting uh, the research work and the, uh, this capital now, philanthropic capital, the free support now has changed to the conditions. And uh, no longer it's the government's uh, voice of these uh, companies like Yara and Monsanto, because it's now their own, uh, they can uh, uh, dominate the, the whole uh, uh, industry. Uh, during the Green Revolution uh, Development State method, now whoever the, uh, who has uh, the sovereign wealth fund, they can dominate these international agencies. Now mainly, if you look at China, India, Brazil, they have the uh, power in the international agencies of the CGIR. Now this slide shows you the compared to status of variety advancer during this in Sri Lanka. Now, until 80s, we were one of the uh, uh, countries that had earliest countries for hybridization has developed high varieties and maintaining high yields. But at the beginning of the 90s, Vietnam increased, uh, started to increase the, jam, uh, the Sri Lankan rice yields. <coughs> and uh, uh, they were, we couldn't push our, now what we achieved in 1970s, BG94 won the yield levels. Because most of our uh, research programs were diverted to abiotic and abiotic stressors to handle. But yield plateaus, we couldn't push further. Even a BG941 is being cultivated by farmers now. Rice varietal de development in the 90s, later mainly focused, as I said, for pests and disease and other biotic stressors. And if you uh, think of other crops, soya bean, this variety PB1 was introduced at this early inception. It's been cultivated until today, now for 40 years. Dambulu red selection is a local selection of Pusa red, which was introduced uh, by India of a big in variety. Farmers have selected a Dambulu red, which is some of the promising variety. It's after 30 years of its cultivation. And granola is the only promising in uh, cultivation uh, in potato farming. Mauritius, we know for no years we are cultivating that. Uh, the only breakthrough, I, to my understanding, the only breakthrough in this after 90s is the in, uh, introduction of Mitch H1, the 
uh, chili variety. We know with the economic liberalization, we had to forego our uh, uh, red chili industry. In 1996, you know, when the seed, imp seed industry was open and there were no pesticides to tackle the leaf uh, uh, viral infect uh, leaf curl, and we had to completely abandon our uh, red chili production. But in 2015, this variety was introduced, and it's one of the very uh, superior variety compared to most of these varieties being imported as exotic varieties. So uh, it's the same picture that I explained. Vietnam jumped from this track, and now they are in a different, uh, they have drifted from our path to the, uh, their programs. Let's see what, and uh, this is uh, one of the calculations which I carried out in one of the studies to show you after 90s, the, the paddy output growth, if you decompose into different uh, factors, inputs and the technology part, we see the TFG, it's negative, 19 to 95, and 90 to 97, it's uh, only 1.1%, and 2005, 1.2, and 2005 to 10, it's 2.5. Again, it's a reason why we started using much of agrochemicals. So we decided it's a technology it has more than above the economic level, because if you uh, apply weedicide, you can control weeds, and you can increase the yield by 30%. So the cost, more than cost it has, which has been captured in this TFG. So it's not really the varietal development, but it's the cause of this new technology, this we decide it has. And you see uh, the progress we made in terms of the paddy output growth is not as remarkable as what we observed during pre and green uh, revolution. Uh, adoption of hybrid technology in Vietnam. So if you take the example, now, from 90s, they have started investing in this hybrid program, and uh, due to this high prominence they placed, because it's the ministry directly involved in this program, and uh, Vietnam was able to uh, jump out of this uh, track. And uh, father of hybrid economics, Yuan Longping from China, he recently uh, declared his latest invention of the third generation hybrid of rice. I think it's a major outbreak, and. Uh, so this technology is advancing in the rest of the world, where we have been little uh, st stay away from this for some uh, reasons, which I'm going to explain you a little bit. Uh, this is the picture of the maize. You see again, Bangladesh again has superseded all the, the, uh, the technologies of all the varietal uh, developments in the other parts, and Vietnam also picking. and. Uh, Thanks to some uh, hybrids imported from uh, other parts, Pacific and others, we were able to also increase because you know there's a high uh, derived demand for maize because of the poultry industry. So this captured some of this technology that was generated in outside the rest of uh, uh, other countries and also multinationals. We, thanks to that, we were able to also push our land uh, yield frontier up. But see the Bangladesh achievements. And potato is the same. Uh, you see that the blue line again, Bangladesh has to take a turn from 2000, late 2000, and uh, uh, along with uh, India, they are now traveling. So again, Bangladesh and uh, Vietnam, India has taken certain steps. Bangladesh Agriculture Research Institute, Bari, began to collaborate with CIMIT for maize uh, developments, research and development. And they produce several b uh, hybrid varieties. At the same time, they got some plant uh, genetic materials also through these collaborations. And uh, also hybrid potato, they went on to uh, uh, develop few varieties and for commercial cultivation. And GM crop development, genetic material uh, uh, crop development, also they have taken steps while at uh, collaborations with some uh, US universities. And uh, already they have release one, now they're waiting for field, uh, not release really, waiting for approval of field cultivation. And uh, uh, when you look at the uh, private sector involved in the Bangladesh, there are several multinational companies working with them. And uh, international development organization based in Bangladesh, BRAC, is one of the oldest inter, uh, NGO 
in this Asia, in Asia, and they are working towards these programs. And some domestic si businesses are, you know, recently we heard of one company is coming and investing, doing some uh, collaborative research, uh, collaborative uh, breeding programs with Sri Lanka, Lal, Lal Tier, yeah, yeah. Most uh, of the world's seed multinational get cultivars in to Bangladesh through locally owned collaborations with uh, these companies. Um, they, this is, I don't know, for some reason they have gone with Syngenta, this uh, agencies to work with, and they get this material uh, hybrid varieties for cultivation. And um, if you look at Vietnam, Vietnam Biosafety Decree was approved in 2010, and they started uh, issuing permits and regulating field trials of GE, GE crops. And um, Vietnam is one of the leading in Asia of uh, cultivating uh, GM crops, and they have uh, now a large extent of GM crops. And also farmers are cultivating uh, some varieties, GM crops that have been imported from other multinationals. Indian, sec Indian uh, agriculture sector is concerned, it's mainly their domestic private sector. They started initial from, uh, because you know, when it comes to hybrid, hybrid heterosis is one which can achieve larger frontiers of yield frontiers, ships, which the private sector invested in selecting, uh, collecting these germplasms, and now they have gone for developing so many F1 hybrids. Okay, what is uh, clear from this uh, explanation, the new technology, what it refers mainly to heterosis and hybrid vigor. Hybrid is first generation progeny of genetically distant different parents. That is particularly cross pollinated plants, you can uh, exploit this uh, vigor and uh, private sector mainly invested in this cross pollinated plants because of this uh, yield uh, achievements they can uh, achieve. And with regard to biotechnology, the countries in the region have gone to uh, for investing in this. And the institutional arrangements, India mainly government and domestic private sector, Bangladesh government NGOs and the multinationals working in hand, and Vietnam government and other agencies altogether. And in terms of the policy, uh, for example, Vietnam has gone to uh, uh, pass the, a decree uh, on this biotech, uh, bio uh, technology, uh, GE trials, field trials, regulating field trials. So these help them to uh, outrader from the uh, ill track that we were all together in once. So um, this is not, I'm, I'm just explaining the situation, what it uh, relates and what we should be adopting is a matter of ours. And uh, we have been also been able to uh, produce Sri Lanka BGs 407H hybrid, but the F1 hybrid, uh, F1 generation has very low yields, therefore we cannot go on to for uh, commercial cultivation. The maize variety, we invested so many years in this, I think this is a, a maize variety is the one that we first started the uh, F1 hybrid program. The some part, the variety, it has not been able to uh, get the uh, farmer's adoption. And the main breakthrough for my understanding is the Chili variety. Uh, it is one of our friend who, uh, the, uh, uh, not invented. He on the uh, developed this variety, and uh, to take potato tissue culture technology, the G0 plant that is also now taking up one of the technologies. But uh, if you uh, look at the continuum of technologies in this modern biotechnology, it goes from. Uh, low-tech processes like uh, nitrogen fixation to tissue culture to high-tech uh, DNA techniques and genetic engineering. So we have been only able to work within these low-tech areas, even that tissue culture technology only is promising in banana and potato. Even now pineapple, I have observed a lot of uh, problems with regard to pineapple uh, uh, tissue culture. It is evident from above that Sri Lanka has drifted away from the global research and development programs and continue to distance from the main innovation path since the mid 80s. Several reasons can be attributed to the factors made internal and external. Economic liberalization, I think the main 
uh, major economic uh, change that happens. The commodity markets and the seed markets were liberalized. But if we were able to compete with these, we wouldn't have a problem. But our, we could not, if you open up, what happened? We cannot compete at all. So it was not because of the policies that we adopted, but it was not the timing of, and that uh, we were not prepared to open in terms of, but actually, if you look at the trade uh, policies, we all see that we have been having an import substitution strategy throughout because to the fact that we couldn't compete with uh, other countries. Now, well, you know what happened to uh, Red Chile. And the political instability after 1983, the gradual distancing working with uh, international NGOs. Unlike in other parts of the world, we have some distrust about uh, NGOs activities. And so we didn't want to work with them collaboratively. And uh, there is also the threat from the world other order changes that germplasm is no longer a open source. We have to either, it is costly now or it's very rare to get. And also the funding for research is also very limited. Now we know recently the ERI and we wanted to have a collaboration, but because of the funding restriction, we couldn't continue. Uh, the other side of it, government mostly invested in irrigation and uh, fertilizer. Irrigation in investment, investment, if you look at irrigation investment, investment. In areas, it was one for the, for the whole public, public expenditure, but now it's about 75% of, this is 2011, of the total investment in uh, uh, irrigation and agriculture. And, and you look at the investment in the research and development, it's just 2%. Irrigation and fertilizer, uh, uh, it's, there's widely held opinion that the monetary benefits it flows from <laughs> as transfers and uh, to the trickle down to the, the line, yeah? Okay. Although now, as we uh, started, I was saying that biochemical technology requires new varieties, at the same time, irrigation, water, fertilizer, and all. But although irrigation, fertilizer are essential inputs for the realization of yields of new varieties, it was found in the 80s and 90s that paddy yields were stagnating and were declining in the absence of new technology. Even if we were to take this frontier to, if, the, if we cannot uh, shift the frontier, even how much you invest on the, your resources, it would be waste of resources. So that we observed in 80s and 90s. Uh, the growth of uh, output due to factor accumulation will eventually taper off, making the growth process unsustainable in the long run. Therefore, investment in research and development is essential for long-term growth. So this is uh, uh, figure shows you in terms of 2011 uh, purchasing power of $80 how much invested in different uh, countries. You, we see that uh, the purple line, Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka started to, start, it started increasing from 2010 up now to the level of 2000 uh, in 2016. This is near the fact that the increasing salaries, I think that's, that <laughs> mainly it's the fact, yeah. Okay, India funding comes from various sources, the not only government, uh, private companies and other foreign donors. And uh, because the private uh, re sector research has, because there's a market, big market they have, and there's incentives for them to invest in this sector, particularly the cross-pollinated plants for the hybrid vigor. And uh, human resource development, uh, if you looked at the uh, department, national re researchers, was even it, it was observed in Adam Payne, uh, uh, take a look at, at this uh, before, during the uh, 60s, 80s, even that time, people didn't want to stay in this sector. They want to shift, move from this for the financial rewarding system is so bad. So uh, even the Department of Agriculture, as a, not as a professional organization, they also want to move to administrative setup for the reason, mere fact that the financial benefits. So, uh, and also, uh, Department DOA Agriculture Service Minute of 1976 did not recognize the importance of professional academic training as a promotion schemes. And uh, there were new entities came like Apex Body, Sri Lanka CARP, NASTEC, and uh, this is to emulate some of the national agriculture research system in other countries. Um, 
I do not know what impact they made and uh, uh, what the in existing infrastructure like DOA, what did it is weakening this? It is a question, I do not know. So, uh, I understand institutional strength is required, particularly the main body that is the research arm of the ag domestic agriculture sector's department of agriculture. And the availability of an access to resources and technology is important. And we have to look for international model, at least for international corporations. <coughs> so in summary, I can say this paper attempted to address the problem of research and science gap experience in the recent past in the Sri Lankan domestic agriculture sector by reviewing what happened in the Sri Lanka and neighboring countries during the Green Revolution and after. The research and science gap became first evident in the last 80s, in late 80s when Sri Lanka rice yield started stagnating and mid 90s when seed industry was opened. After the Green Revolution, Sri Lanka drifted from its innovation path for a number of factors. With the private sector and multinational companies started to dominate in the seed industry and the patenting of plants, they have made restriction in open access genetic resources for varietal development in the developing countries and this affected Sri Lanka too. Also the development assistant to consortium uh, that uh, for international agriculture research has contracted and the ownership of capital determined the needs of the seed industry. Developing countries collective effort in search of new technology now mostly bound to state capacity to invest in technology generation and hence innovation. Although Sri Lanka benefits from technology products from other countries, Sri Lanka has been uh, judging from its innovation path as states funds have not been adequate and human resource de development is not far reaching. Science and technology policy to address in filling research and science gap given the current scenario and science diplomacy must have an important role to play. So that's my uh, last slide. These are some other references. So I bring in some ideas uh, to the science, one of the main bodies we are to think and uh, re uh, think and rethink and rethink. Yeah. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Dr. Vasanti Vikramasinghe. She's the president of Section F of uh, SLAs. So to mark the excellent presentation, a little appreciation from the council.
this will be uh, this uh, presidential address will be done by the president of section a of uh, sri lanka association for this uh, advancement of science by mrs inoka sandanayaka she is a scientific officer at the research division of national science foundation in sri lanka she graduated from the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Animal Sciences, University of Peradeniya in 22, and obtained her master's in veterinary public health and epidemiology from the Royal Veterinary College, United Kingdom. And she has uh, working experience as a scientific officer at the National Science Foundation from 27. She was the President of the Sri Lanka Association for Laboratory Animal Sciences in 19, 2019, and she got a Commonwealth Scholarship for postgraduate studies in 2015. So I would like to invite Ms. Inoka Sandanayaka, the President of the Sri Lanka Association for the Advancement of Science, Section A in 2020. Thank you, Madam. Good morning, Madam President, Professor Janita Lianage, past presidents, members of the council, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. The topic of my presidential address is making a difference in public health, the role of veterinarians. I will be talking on a general topic. Have you ever thought of a veterinarian when you think of public health? Are they only concerned with animal health? Let's see. A veterinarian is a person qualified to treat animal illnesses and perform surgery on animals. When you think of a veterinarian, you think of pet dogs or cats or farm animals. However, the actual contributions of veterinary medicine is much wider, which includes animal health, human health, as well as the environment. However, even many veterinarians uh, do not recognize the relevance of their daily professional activities which have on public health. Uh, actually, the as uh, Association for Am American uh, Veterinary Medical Colleges identified vet veterinarians as the only professionals trained to link animal diseases, human diseases, food safety, and bioterrorism agents. The World Health Organization defines public health as the art and science of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health through the organized efforts of society. Public health is an interdisciplinary field and includes the services of many professionals, including community physicians, epidemiologists, biostatisticians, public health inspectors, midwives, microbiologists, veterinarians, etc. Veterinary public health is uh, defined as a component of public health uh, and it is uh, defined as the sum of all contributions to the complete physical, mental, and social well-being of humans through an understanding and application of veterinary science. VPH is a major part of public health, where human health and human well-being is the central tasks. If you just talk about the history of veterinary medicine, uh, the earliest documented reference to veterinary medicine is found in Mesopotamian civilization, 
uh, concurrent to the domestication of animals. However, in early times, there was no clear distinction between uh, human medicine and animal, me uh, animal uh, medicine. The concept of veterinary public health originated in ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, and China concurrently, where healer priests cared for both human patients and animals. They applied uh, the knowledge uh, from, uh, they got from the anatomy of animals and applied in the treatment of humans. According to Mahavansha, uh, veterinary hospitals were established by ancient kings with veterinary doctors appointed to treat animals, especially cattle, in most villages. Traditional physicians in Sri Lanka regularly treated both human and animal patients. A well-known uh, king of Sri Lanka is King Buddha Dasa, who, who was a reputed medical and a veterinary surgeon. Veterinary pract practitioners' involvement in public health can be broadly categorized into the following areas. Food production and safety, zoonosis management, liaisons with other professionals, roles of animals in society, and environmental aspects. When we talk about food production and safety, many people mistakenly believe that meat hygiene and inspection services to be the sole meaning of veterinary public health. But food production and safety is only one aspect of VPH. The veterinary contribution aspect uh, to this public health comes from the involvement with production of food of animal origin and affirming the safety of such food for human consumption. So the farm level uh, activities include uh, increasing productivity and keeping the animals healthy. The activities uh, some of the activities are control diseases that reduce productivity uh, in animals such as foot and mouth disease, mastitis, brucellosis, etc. Improve the nutrition of the animals, improve fertility and breeding, advice on an animal hus husbandry practices. These activities will contribute to provide an adequate supply of animal proteins to the rising demands of the human population. And the improved uh, new nutritional status of the public will have a direct impact on public health. Food safety involves the reduction of foodborne risks to human health due to hazards arising from animal production. Foodborne diseases are usually infectious or toxic in nature and are caused by bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites and chemical substances. Foodborne pathogens can cause severe diarrhea or debilitating infections, including meningitis. Some of the examples are Salmonella, Campylobacter, E. coli, tapeworms, prions, etc. The World Health Organization reports that every year about 600 million, that is almost 1 in 10 people in the world, fall ill after eating contaminated food. And more than 400,000 die every year because of foodborne diseases. However, in developing countries like Sri Lanka, uh, these uh, foodborne uh, diseases are rarely reported and investigated to find out the causes of, uh, of these uh, uh, illnesses. Uh, therefore, there is uh, severe underreporting of foodborne diseases in developing countries. Food safety involves the concept farm to fork which means that all stages of the food chain from production at the farm through transport of animal products, animals or products, processing, storage, distribution, up to human consumption must be contamination free. Safety of food starts at the farm level uh, through control of zoonotic diseases in the livestock, presenting disease-free animals for slaughter, ensuring cleanliness, and inspection at each level of the processing chain to assure quality and absence of contamination. In Sri Lanka, the poultry sector is uh, in the poultry sector. Veterinarians are heavily involved in uh, controlling this uh, uh, food safety. However, uh, in uh, when you talk of cattle uh, and other animals, it's mostly the inspection of uh, meat after slaughter that occurs uh, in this regard. 
introduction of food production chain control such as HACCP which is hazard analysis and critical control points and GMP good manufacturing practice has made a considerable impact in assuring quality and control of foodborne pathogens such as salmonella and E. coli. The public health veterinarian's involvement in this process is critical. However, the, as I told you, the level of inv uh, involvement depends dif uh, differs depending on the country. Uh, the international agencies involved in food safety of animal products are Animal Production Food Safety Network, Safety Working Group of the World Health Organization, uh, sorry, World Organization for Animal Health, OIE, WHO, World Health Organization, FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, and Codex Alimentarius Commission. In recent times, there has been an increase in the international movement of animals and animal products. If not carried out under proper control, this will pave a way for transboundary migration of infectious agents. The next uh, role of veterinarians in public health is zoonosis management. Zoonoses are diseases or infections that are naturally transmissible from vertebrate animals to humans. Research shows that more than 200 zoonoses have been identified so far, and the infectious agents are bacteria, viruses, bacteria, parasites, prions, etc. And also, nearly 75% of newly emerging diseases are known to be zoonotic. Also, 60% of all human diseases are also uh, described to be zoonotic in nature. Globally, more than 2 billion people are affected and more than 2 million deaths occur annually uh, due to zoonotic diseases. However, these data are pre-COVID data, uh, whereas now uh, I think at present COVID has caused uh, more than 1.6 million deaths globally. Uh, examples of uh, zoonotic diseases are COVID-19, SARS or the severe acute respiratory syndrome, avian influenza, human immunodeficiency virus or HIV, Ebola virus, Nipah virus, brucellosis, leptospirosis, toxoplasmosis. Some of these involve uh, birds, cattle, even this toxoplasmosis is mostly from your pet cats. Uh, so a wide variety of animal species are involved in uh, transmitting these diseases from domesticated animals that are the companion animals as well as farm animals, peridomesticated animals such as rats and wild, wild animals, they act as reservoirs. When we talk of uh, zoonosis, we talk of emerging zoonosis. Uh, an emerging zoonosis is a newly recognized or a newly evolved organism that has occurred previous that may have occurred previously but shows an increase in incidence or expansion into new geographical areas a new host range or a vector range events leading to this emergence of uh, new diseases include microbial uh, microbiological adaptation environmental changes globalization of food production and trade habitat destruction and urbanization human behavioral factors including tourism, rec recreational sports, bushmeat consumption, and companion animals. Because of these uh, reasons, actually uh, the wild animals harbor many pathogens, some of, which may we, some of which we may not have come to contact with as yet. What happens is because of the human activities, uh, situation occurs where the wild animals come into contact with either domesticated animals or people and then uh, the uh, organisms may cross the species barrier and come into uh, another species. One such example is the Nipah virus in, uh, Malaysia, in Malaysia. What happened was the, this virus was harbor, uh, uh, the fruit bats were harboring this virus and uh, pig farms were located near these fruit trees and uh, the uh, this virus uh, jumped from these uh, fruit bats into the pigs and then from the pigs uh, into uh, human uh, humans 
So, uh, likewise, because of uh, this, uh, especially uh, bushmeat consumption. Now, Ebola virus was uh, uh, that also came from a bat because of uh, eating uh, bat meat in Africa. That is how that uh, e Ebola virus emerged. Uh, some of the major global zo zoonotic outbreaks in the past, I have listed some here. Uh, now, uh, the World Bank estimates that uh, total economic losses from these uh, several outbreaks alone to be about 80 billion US dollars. When considering Sri Lankan situation, the most endemic, uh, the most important endemic zoonotic disease in Sri Lanka are considered to be rabies and leptospirosis. I think rabies, uh, most of you are aware of rabies, but the awareness on leptospirosis is uh, not, uh, I think is uh, limited uh, still at present because uh, leptospirosis we call as miuna and we think it's from uh, uh, from the rats, but actually no, uh, it is spread from uh, all livestock, it ca could be spread from all uh, livestock animals, uh, wild animals, even companion animals, especially in Sri Lanka uh, through cattle, uh, through their urine this uh, virus is excreted and uh, when farmers uh, wade in the mud all day, that is how the uh, virus gets through the skin into the uh, person. Uh, which ca uh, which could cause uh, even kidney failure and death. Uh, leptospirosis is identified by WHO as an in as one of the neglected tropical diseases, and Sri Lanka is considered to have one of the highest prevalence of leptospirosis globally. Uh, the role of veterinarians in zoonotic management uh, is. Uh, through vaccination campaigns, treatment and containment of diseased animals, control of stray animal populations, public awareness, surveillance and outbreak investigations, quarantine of animals crossing borders, inspection of food of animal origin. It is extremely difficult to predict which zoonotic disease may arise in future, but diagnosis and control of the zoonotic disease at the animal level and working in collaboration with other related professionals will prevent the disease from advancing to e epidemic or even to pandemic proportions and reduce economic losses. The global early warning and response system for major animal diseases, including zoonosis, is developed by the WHO, FAO and the OIE. They act in uh, surveillance and a sharing of data between countries of uh, emerging zoonoses. The next role of veterinarians in this regard is liaisons with other professionals. Because veterinary public health cannot operate in isolation, it needs to liaise with many other professionals, including medical professionals. Though not a new concept, more recently, the One Health approach has received recognition by WHO, FAO and the OIE as an effective way to improve public health. One Health is defined as a collaborative effort of multiple disciplines to attain optimal health for people, animals and the environment. One Health strategies are highly cost effective. It improves effectiveness of core public health systems, sustainability Sustain, uh, sorry, substantially reducing morbidity, mortality, and economic costs of outbreaks. For example, the government of Canada has successfully implemented the One Health approach in integrating veterinary and human diagnostic services and has reported a reduction of 26% of the operational costs through this One Health approach. When considering the role of animals in society, the role of animals in society uh, animals serve many roles in society, ranging from a source of food uh, to other animal products, wool, leather, etc., work and transport, companionship, sports, cultural icons, experimental animals, drug manuf uh, used in drug manufacture. Uh, the, it is the responsibility of the VPH practitioner to safeguard public health as well as the welfare of these animals while minimizing the risks to human health. 
different societies have different views toward different species of animals. However, in recent times, welfare of animals has come to the forefront in many countries. Welfare is defined as a physical and mental state of an animal in relation to the conditions in which it lives and dies. The guiding principles are the five freedoms. Freedom from hunger, malnutrition and thirst. Freedom from fear and distress. Freedom from physical discomfort. Freedom from pain, injury and disease. And freedom to express normal patterns of behavior. With the growing global population, the increased need for meat and other animal products is inevitable. Consequently, the intensification of livestock production systems is to be expected, and the welfare of these farm animals has to be looked after by the public health veterinarian. Also, animals are used for biomedical research as models to study disease and to test new medication, vaccines, etc. Commonly used laboratory animals are rats, mice, guinea pigs, uh, pigs and rabbits and non-humid primates. Uh, the uh, VPH officers should ensure that these animals are used under humane conditions. Another major concern of public health is uh, uh, with public health importance is the uh, emergence of antimicrobial resistant organisms. AMR occurs when bacteria, viruses, fungi and parasites change over time and no longer respond to medications that were effective previously. Extensive use of antimicrobial in intensive production systems as growth promoters, prophylaxis, prophylaxis and metaphylaxis agents over time is one reason for this emergence of resistant microorganisms. Uh, WHO has declared AMR as one of the top 10 global public health threats facing humanity. The Sri Lankan government has banned the importation, of, uh, importation and use of antibiotic growth promoters for livestock production. Uh, surveillance and collection of information on resistant microorganisms is uh, uh, the duty of public health veterinarian. And in Sri Lanka, one such example is the One Health Poultry Hub, where the poultry sector is uh, surveyed for uh, resistant organisms. Another important role of animals in society is as companion animals. This is associated with the mental well-being of humans, which is part of the definition of health by WHO. As well as using animals as pets, they are also used as guide dogs uh, for visually and hearing impaired persons and companion animals for terminally ill patients. It's the uh, public health veterinarian's responsibility to educate owners of the possible risk of zoonosis and ensure that these animals do not access, uh, act as disease transmitters. The, another aspect of veterinary public health is the environment. Livestock are a major source of environmental contamination. Contamination can result from organic waste from the animals, or a byproduct of their uh, management, for example, use of antibiotics or uh, insecticides. Uh, substantial volumes of waste are produced in intensive farm systems, and the correct disposal of these are essential from a public health viewpoint. Even though animal waste is considered as fertilizer and is introduced back into the land, this poses the risk of transmission of infectious agents. This would only cause contamination of this would not only cause contamination of land but also of water bodies. And greenhouse gas em uh, released from the ruminant supply chain and the bad smell from pig farms are other environmental concerns. Even uh, it may not be uh, such a uh, big uh, concern in Sri Lanka, but in uh, in countries like China, Taiwan, these uh, greenhouse gases and the bad smell from pig farms is considered as a uh, big concern uh, in, in their societies. Uh, another responsibility for of the public health veterinarian is the correct disposal of clinical waste. And how do we make a difference? You can see from my presentation that veterinarians play a vital role in the well-being of humanity. Horizontal and vertical coordination between different agencies involved in public health at local and regional, uh, sorry, local, regional and national levels 
is important uh, for effective delivery of veterinary public health services. Close collaboration and mutual respect between public health and veterinary medical uh, med uh, medicine uh, professionals is crucial to attain optimum public health. Policies and procedures should be in place to integrate veterinary knowledge in the decision-making process through the supply of necessary data such as surveillance data and disease information. Veterinary public health services should be equipped with the necessary technologies, personnel, etc. to respond to these requirements. Globally, the future of public health will rely heavily on One Health approach, which promotes synergy at various levels. However, locally, uh, as yet, it has not materialized to an effective level. Therefore, I believe by means of a coordinated and multidisciplinary approach, it will be possible to make a difference in public health. These are some of the references that I've used. Thank you for your patience listening. I would also like to take this opportunity uh, to thank my parents uh, for nurturing me, uh, my teachers at Anla Vidyale and University of Peradeniya for their guidance, past and present chairpersons and director generals of the National Science Foundation, my superiors and colleagues for their encouragement and support. Um, and the committees of uh, Section A, past and present, for their support. And a special word of thanks, even though she is not here, Dr. Marita Amitya Goda, for introducing me to SLAS. And last but not least, my family, uh, my husband, Upul, and my daughters, Ovindi and Venudi, for their love and support always. Thank you. So thank you very much, Mrs. Inoka Sandanayaka, uh, for the for the very informative uh, presidential address. And uh, a token of appreciation for your valuable contribution as the president of Section A SLAS 2020. So we'll have a break now and come back in half an hour's time.